everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me along here today. Um, I think you now know almost everything about me, <laughs> <laughs> apart from what I'm going to tell you now. Um, that was a great talk from Dermot. It was really lovely to, uh, for me because I've known Dermot for some time uh, because of our involvement with Bletchley Park to actually hear your talk, Dermot. So that was really cool. Um, so I suppose I first got involved uh, with Bletchley Park. I first went up there in 2003. So at the time I was, um, I think, a PhD student and uh, I'd set up a network for women in tech, BCS Women. And uh, I went up there for a meeting. I didn't really know very much about Bletchley Park. I think all I knew then really, well, in fact, what I, th what I thought I knew wasn't correct, uh, was that there was probably about 50 old guys that worked there. And I just kind of imagined them uh, sitting around code breaking, kind of smoking pipes, wearing tweed jackets, <laughs> uh, and maybe doing the Times crossword in, on the side. And that's kind of how I thought, that's what I thought was happening at Bletchley Park the first time I went there. Um, so I went there for a meeting, and, and after the meeting, uh, I went for a walk around the site and ended up bumping into these guys who were re uh, building this amazing um, kind of like feat of engineering in the corner of one of the huts. And I went over and chatted to them and found out that actually that was the Turing's bomb machine they were rebuilding. They were about halfway through at the time. Uh, I started chatting to the guys about what they were doing. Um, and then they asked me why I was there. So I said, I'm here representing this group, Women in Technology. And um, uh, John Harper, the, the guy that was leading the team, said, oh, did you know that more than half the people that worked here were women? So I said, no, I didn't know any women worked here. How many people worked here? So he said, more than 10,000. So I was like completely blown away by that, A, because 10,000 people, and I thought it was 50 old guys, uh, and B, because more than half of those people were women. So I went away uh, that time really wanting to raise awareness of the uh, women that worked at Bletchley Park. Um, and uh, eventually, after some time, managed to raise some funding to run an oral history project. Uh, so we interviewed some of the women that worked there because I really wanted to capture their memories um, because, of course, you know, they, they weren't spring chickens. They, they were getting on a bit, uh, unfortunately. And I, I was really worried that, that everyone that knew what happened there would die before we got a chance to uh, interview them. I forgot to put my slides forward. <laughs> so so this, is, uh, this is the BCS Women Group uh, here in 2002. Um, so it was about a year after this that I, I went up to Bletchley Park uh, representing them. And so uh, here are some of the uh, women that worked at Bletchley Park and two of the women that we interviewed, uh, Jean Bourne and uh, Ruth Bourne and Jean Valentine, uh, standing here with the, the bomb machine. So they were bomb operators. So uh, we ran this oral history project and um, at the launch of that uh, at the BCS, the British Computer Society in London, um, I gave a talk saying, you know, why I thought we needed to record the, the women's memories, um, uh, the women that work there. And then Simon Greenish, who was then the CEO of Bletchley Park, gave a talk. Uh, and he said that um, he was really worried that uh, Bletchley Park might have to close. So he, at the time, he was worried that um, everyone was talking about a swine flu epidemic. And he was really worried that uh, the visitor numbers might drop if there was a swine flu epidemic. And the main money that uh, Bletchley Park had then to... Uh, came from gate receipts, so from people visiting. He was really worried that if the numbers of people visiting dropped, uh, the income coming into Bletchley Park would drop, and, uh, and so they'd have to close. So he told us about that, um, and he said that he uh, thought that Bletchley Park was, his words were, teetering on a financial knife edge. So I kind of, after that day, I was kind of worried about that. I thought that was wrong. Um, but then I got invited up to a reception at Bletchley Park a couple of months later, and uh, did a proper tour, which I'd not done before, with one of the veterans. Got to hear much more about what happened there. Was told that the work done at Bletchley Park was said to have shortened the war by two years and that 11 million people a year were dying during World War II. And I just had this moment where I was, I was standing, looking at this hut with a blue tarpaulin, uh, listening to a veteran who worked there telling us about the major code-breaking achievements at Bletchley Park. And I, I just stood there thinking, and this place might have to close? That's terrible. So I went away and basically uh, started a campaign to save it. Uh, by that time, so this is a few years later, I was then um, head of department um, at the University of Westminster, head of a computer science department. So I, I just thought to myself, what, what can I do? You know, Bletchley Park can't close. Just uh, the, um, the st all the stuff that happened there is just really incredible. Not enough people know about it. And so I was kind of trying to work out what I could do about it. Then I saw uh, that there was a, someone had set up a petition on the 10 Downing Street website um, saying, you know, the government needs to save Bletchley Park. 
So um, I found the link to that. I sent it round to all the other heads and professors of computer science in the country, <coughs> because we were all on an email list, uh, asking them to sign the petition. I sent a photo of the, uh, of the hut with the blue tarp all in and said, you know, that the work that was done there had shortened the war by two years and 11 million people a year were said to have been dying. And asked everyone, asked all the heads and professors across the UK to sign the petition. Um, and then I looked at the petition, so in those days you could see who'd signed the petition. I looked at the petition a few hours later and was amazed to find that um, the people that had written the textbooks, uh, for me when I was a, a student of computing at university, I recognised lots of the names of you know, really famous uh, professors of computing from around the UK. So I got very excited then because I just thought, okay, it's not just me that thinks this. All these people that I think, oh my God, I'm not worthy uh, you know, to uh, even contact them. Um, had signed it as well, so that kind of gave me the confidence to move forward. Um, so that was very cool. Um, I decided to set up a blog uh, and try and uh, raise awareness of what happened at Bletchley Park and how important it was. Uh, so here's my uh, blog here. Um, looks very old school now, it's quite funny looking at it. Um, so it's about 2008 and um, uh, then I was just trying to work out, well, what else can we do? So all these people uh, who are professors of computing care about this as much as I do. What can I do about that? So um, basically I emailed uh, all the uh, journalists that I knew and, and said, I think this is a story, we need to save Bletchley Park. Uh, and luckily one of those journalists was Rory Keflin jones from the BBC. And so the next week after that he took me up to Bletchley Park and filmed me there and got that out on BBC News and Today programme, uh, and that went worldwide, which was a bit of a shock for me, because I wasn't really used to being in the media, uh, when suddenly, you know, like one week, I'm just like a normal head of department at university, and the next week, I have friends in Australia saying, I just saw you on TV, like, you know, BBC America. Uh, so it was a bit of a shock, but it, it was good. Um, and uh, I got to do, like, my first live TV, which is very scary. Um, and I actually, I remember sitting there thinking, if only I could just have a heart attack and die. Uh, <laughs> I would prefer that to, to going on live TV, like News at One or whatever it was. But unfortunately, I didn't die, or fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it was a, le a great learning experience for me. Um, so that was great. The message got out there. Lots of people got in touch by email. But then like a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, what was I going to do? I couldn't go back to the news, right? I couldn't go back and say it's a new story because it's not a new story. So, a news needs to be new. So, I was casting around for some time trying to work out what to do. And then, uh, a few months later, I started using um, Twitter in earnest, really. I'd signed up before and thought it was rubbish, and then just kind of left it. And then I ended up at a conference sitting next to people that loved Twitter. And um, so, it was like the end of 2008. And uh, I suddenly realised, actually, Twitter could be a way of really getting out there, finding people that care about Bletchley Park, and uh, kind of creating a community of people uh, that cared about Bletchley Park, and kind of all work together to try and raise the profile of, uh, of Bletchley Park. Um, so through Twitter, um, I didn't really tweet much about Bletchley Park, but already, just because I had the link to my, um, my blog in, the, in my Twitter bio, uh, then lots of people started getting in touch with me saying they wanted to help to save Bletchley Park. So that was amazing. And so here are the uh, photos that you can see here uh, on screen. So there's uh, Captain Jerry Roberts, who's one of the uh, code breakers, who uh, led the test at Bletchley Park. He's an amazing guy. So he'd got in touch with me in the summer when I'd first been on TV. Um, he's there giving a talk at UCL and his talk's online. So I recommend uh, if you Google Captain Jerry Roberts, um, UCL, you should get his, uh, he's got a one hour lecture about what he did there, um, which is really interesting. Uh, and these other guys too in the other photos, so people that have got in touch with me through Twitter who were like social media uh, gurus, you know, knew a lot more about social media and Twitter than I did in 2008. Um, and so we all went along to one of uh, Captain Jerry Roberts' talks uh, and then we all went up to uh, Bletchley Park, I think the next day. And it was really great to see people who really knew what to do with social media at Bletchley Park, you know, just so excited about everything that was, that was there, trying to kind of cover everything and kind of get the message out there. And so within a few days, really, I kind of realised that actually Twitter was an amazing tool, an amazing way to really sort of amplify your voice. And um, running a campaign through Twitter really made a massive impact quite quickly. So another thing that um, happened through Twitter was that 
so you know, I'd started trying to trying to build uh, a community, get people excited about Bletchley Park, um, and uh, I was trying to think of people who uh, were kind of like key influential people who might be interested in Bletchley Park, and I, I saw this um, photo. Stephen Fry posted this photo um, in I think February two thousand and nine, um, and oh, the dates on there, yeah, February two thousand and nine. <laughs> so uh, he posted this photo uh, saying. Basically, they're stuck in a lift uh, in Centre Point in London, and they couldn't get out. And it's like he was tweeting, you know, like we've rang the we've rang the emergency uh, bell, we've tried phoning the number, no one's come. So he just tried tweeting as well. So, so I saw that photo of Stephen Fry, and I thought well, Stephen Fry, he must be interested in Bletchley Park. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I googled Stephen Fry Bletchley Park, and sure enough, he was. And there are various quotes from him um, saying. Stuff like, you know, if Bletchley Park were to close, it would be like Nelson's Column falling down and all sorts of stuff like that. So I knew he was on board. So luckily, he was following me on Twitter. Um, so I sent him several direct messages saying, if you got involved in the campaign, I'm sure you would make a really big difference. You know, please could you tweet about it? Um, and the next morning, I got this tweet. So Stephen Fry tweeted out um, my, a link to my, uh, um, my blog and uh, asking people to sign the petition. And instead of, I was getting then, I think about 50 hits a day on my blog, which I thought was great. Uh, <laughs> but then with one tweet from Stephen Fry, I got 8,000. <laughs> so that kind of, you know, shows you the difference. And I think then he had like 200,000 oh. followers, whereas now he's got several million. So it just kind of shows you, if you find the right people, you can just have a massive impact really quickly. So, over, I mean, over, I guess the campaign kind of ran really over about three years. So I've just told you roughly about the stuff that happened in the first six months. Um, but what, what we did, because lots and lots of people got involved and, you know, I was kind of like cheerleading the way, but lots of people were just doing their own thing. So we had people organising uh, uh, comedy nights um, as a benefit for Bletchley Park, people walking up to Everest Base Camp. Just really, really cool stuff. And just loads of people just went off and did their own thing, which I think was really cool to raise money for Bletchley Park and awareness of Bletchley Park. And one uh, great thing uh, that we realised early on was that because we had so many people who were quite active on social media and understood tech, basically lots of geeks, it was quite easy to um, get them to talk to other people. You know, practically everyone I spoke to, I, you know, I said, what can you do for Bletchley Park? And go and tell all your friends. And it, it really did work. You know, the message really spread. And so I might have kind of started it off, but it just kind of gradually just got bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more people involved, which was amazing. Um, so uh, what happened with various things like um, uh, the Building with Pride Award, which I think this is about, yeah, Building Prize. Uh, the Building with Pride Award was so there'd uh, be some organisation which would have a competition, and this one was uh, Building with Pride, and um, basically you need lots of people to vote for your um, site, so the site was Bletchley Park. And um, we kind of had a running battle with um, the Needles Old Battery on the Isle of Wight. Um, you know, you could see online who was winning, and um, as soon as it looked like the Needles Old Battery was, you know, was kind of moving up in terms of the amount of votes that they got, you know, we'd sort of push out loads of stuff and get people to vote and like tell everyone else and get them to vote and kind of do it in a, a really, um, not a chain reaction, like a, like a ripple effect kind of uh, a way to try and get more and more people to, um, to vote on stuff or to lobby people or it, it just grew into some really kind of amazing organic um, campaign uh, over the years. And so it was like if someone saw some opportunity, they'd alert someone else and they'd alert. And it just kind of grew into this massive thing where as soon as there was one, some, one message, someone pinged something, it just went out really quickly to lots and lots of people. And then we all <laughs> swooped in to, uh, to do whatever it was that um, uh, needed to be done. So campaigned over several years. Um, here's my family. So my two sons there, um, for their 23rd birthday, so this is during the campaign, I said that I'd take them on a, a surprise trip. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was so looking back, I just think, how on earth did they put up with me doing all this stuff over several years? But um, so for their 23rd birthday, uh, they got an exciting trip to Bletchley Park. <laughs> and here we are standing outside uh, Station X. And uh, it's just, I couldn't have done what I'd done without my family supporting me. And they've, they've just been so ridiculously supportive. You know, even my kids kind of um, 
growing up like my little one there you know they've they've all basically put up with me spending so much spare time um, trying to raise awareness of Bletchley Park and I really thank them for that so just a couple of other things that we did uh, during the time um, as I said I was always trying to find influential people I found a guy called Phil Willis MP who was who just started using Twitter um, and uh, he was head of the universities and science committee um, I saw him tweeting and I just thought oh, I'm going to see you know if he's interested in Bletchley Park I think he probably will be so I tweeted him ended up chatting to him on Twitter uh, and then got a 10 minute slot to go in and chat to him about Bletchley Park so I went in to see him and uh, you know told him all about the campaign and said what what can you do what can you do for Bletchley Park and he said I'll set up an EDM. So I said, wow, that's great. What's an EDM? I had absolutely no idea what it was. Uh, and it's an early day motion, which he said was basically to raise awareness uh, in Parliament or in government uh, around different issues. And so here he set up an EDM uh, asking for operational funding for Bletchley Park. So another thing that happened was I really wanted to introduce um, the people at Bletchley Park, the management, to the International Museum community to kind of get them networked in with all of these people around the world. And I also wanted the International Museum community to know about Bletchley Park and what they were doing um, and the fact that they needed help. So uh, I wrote a, a paper with Kelsey Griffin from Bletchley Park and Professor Jonathan Bowen, who's a museums expert. And uh, we submitted our paper and luckily it got accepted for this conference. Um, and then when it got accepted, I thought, oh no, what have I done? Because the conference is in Denver. I've now kind of set Bletchley Park up to have to pay for me and someone else to go over to Denver and deliver the paper. But what I'm actually trying to do is to get money to come into Bletchley Park. So I was a bit depressed about what I did, this sort of uh, this situation that I'd engineered, not really thinking about the money aspect. And so just chatting about that on Twitter uh, with some friends, uh, they persuaded me to set up a Just Giving account, uh, which I did. And it amazed me that um, within two weeks it was fully funded, which meant that we could go over to uh, Denver and deliver our paper, which was great. And this, uh, these are the avatars of all the people that um, funded it, so thanks very much to them. As my favourite is Mr Grasshead at the top in the middle. <laughs> and so uh, while we were in Denver, after we delivered the paper and the conference finished, we got stuck there because of the Icelandic volcano. So a, <laughs> a crazy thing that happened was that um, someone that was coming over here to give a talk, I think at Bletchley Park, um, on software testing, uh, we had a mutual friend and they saw that we were stuck in Denver and their plane got turned around in the air so they were halfway to England and they got sent back to Denver. So we ended up meeting up for breakfast um, uh, one Sunday and you know, chatting about uh, Bletchley Park and stuff. And, um, and so uh, it's Lisa Crispin, um, who is uh, the, the person that we invited for breakfast. Uh, she was saying, what, what are you guys going to do today? And we'd kind of been stuck in the conference in Denver uh, for several days. So we were like, we want, we want to get out of uh, Denver and just go and see some countryside. And so basically she invited us for a day at her friend's ranch. Uh, and this is me learning how to uh, talk to a llama. By, by blowing up its nose. So I just think it's like, like a llama whispering. So I just thought just some really random things happened to me, but great fun too. Um, so in 2011, about three years after we started campaigning, um, Simon Greenish, the director, said that um, Bletchley Park was saved, that he knew then that uh, they were financially stable and they wouldn't uh, have to close. So that was really cool. How much time have I got? Four minutes, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So... Um, so another quick thing, uh, which involves <coughs> Google. So I don't know if you saw a few years ago that the uh, Turing papers, or some of Turing's papers, were up for auction at Christie's. And um, a great guy called Gareth Harpercree set up uh, a Just Giving account to try and help Bletchley Park to buy the Turing papers. Um, and after a couple of weeks, he'd raised £20,000, which was really great, but I think the asking price was 300000 <laughs> so unfortunately he wasn't anywhere near that and um, I was at um, an event at Nesta and uh, Megan Smith from Google uh, was speaking on the platform, I didn't know her and um, I just, I was kind of thinking, you know, I need to approach people, who, who can I talk to? And then I just thought, Google, they must have some money. <laughs> 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 it's quite funny saying that here, because normally I'm saying that with people who, who aren't at Google. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad you all laughed and didn't throw stuff at me. <laughs> so um, uh, Google, they must have some money. So basically I went and chat to Megan, 
told her about, uh, about Turing, about Bletchley Park. Uh, she said, send me an email. So I sent her an email and luckily, um, a couple of days later or a day later, a guy called Simon Meacham, um, who you might know from Google, who was working here, um, got in touch via Twitter and basically I told him what I told Megan and, um, and basically what happened was they worked together with um, Peter Barron from here, I think, to um, raise $100,000 to help uh, Bletchley Park buy the Turing Papers. So unfortunately that wasn't enough, but there were some things went on behind the scenes and eventually uh, Bletchley Park did get the Turing Papers, so that was great. So thank you, Google, for making that happen. Um, so one of the greatest things for me uh, in being involved has is, is been to meet uh, some of the veterans, because they're just incredible people. They're kind of everything you want them to be. They're really smart, usually really, you know, really good sense of humour, just kind of like rapier-like wit. And so this is Jerry Roberts here meeting the Queen, which, so it was a great moment to, you know, to see that happen, because when I'd started campaigning, you know, it's like most, um, institutions uh, just weren't, traditional institutions just weren't interested or just um, weren't that keen, I think, really to get involved with Bletchley. So the, the way that everyone saw Bletchley Park kind of now as a going concern was, was great that that changed. And it was great to see uh, the veterans getting recognition as well. That was really cool. And um, here's just, I like, like this photo. It's me and Simon Meacham from Google. So this is uh, the first time we met up after we had this whole, it's in the book, I can't, I can't do it justice in uh, one minute or something, but we had with um, Megan and Simon Meacham and me trying to get the, the $100,000 from Google and trying to make stuff happen. Uh, we just kind of had this very exciting time with lots of phone calls and uh, it was very cool. And so uh, this is the first time that we got to meet up after all of that happened, see the Turing papers at Bletchley Park and, and this is our photo with, um, with the statue of Alan Turing. So that's a really quick uh, run through of um, several years uh, campaigning. Um, I'm delighted to be here and happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I, don't, I can give you my opinion. I can give you my opinion, but I don't actually know the answer. I mean, in my opinion, I think because it was all kept secret for such a long time, it's just not really in our public consciousness. And so, by the time everyone started to know what had actually happened there, it's like it had kind of been written out of history, really. So it's like quite hard to then put something back into history. And I think it's just taken time because I've just seen a, a really big change in people's attitudes from when, you know, like 2007, when I, I started campaigning, um, you know, most people would, <coughs> were sort of interested, but not really, you know, whereas now, if you talk about Bletchley Park, everyone's like, oh, Bletchley Park, you know, it's really, really changed in like, what's that, eight years now. Um, and I just think probably because it was kind of written out of history, so it's quite hard to just put it back in. But like once everyone hears the stories, you know, hears lots of different people speaking about what happened there, then that, that kind of, um, that helps it to grow in people's minds of what it actually was, and they hear it from various different places, not just one place. So, that's my guess. Hey, um, you actually went to a female site in Bletchley Park like a week ago. Cool. Awesome. So thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, this is more about. Um, so the we went to see the National Museum of the People, which is also at Bletchley Park. Yeah. And it seemed like Bletchley Park had a lot of money, a lot of funding, and was and was doing really well. The National Museum of the People, well, fantastic, but really struggling. Um, and when we when we spoke to the people about it, there seemed to be a little bit of a dispute <laughs> between the two groups. I don't yeah. know if you have anything to add on that, because it seems like both of those are equally, equally yeah. worthy of preservation, because the National Museum of the People has colossus in it. Um, yeah. And that, that should not be lost, and, and we should definitely keep that. Um, 
I don't know what your view is on that. I'm in camera. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there, there's, it, I still don't really know why the dispute happened. I don't know. Um, probably Dermot probably knows more about it than I do, uh, having been involved longer. But it, from my point of view, it seems to me that they're both, they're, they both kind of want the same thing. Um, they're both preserving stuff which is really, really important. Um, I have always really wanted them to work together, but for various reasons that hasn't happened. Yeah, Dermot's got his thumb up as well. Because I think being separate, they, there's less opportunities for the site as a whole. And I think most people from the outside see it as one place. And I, for, I still, right, even though I know, I still forget to say, and the Museum of Computing. Because <laughs> in my head still, it's, it's all the same place, right? But, but they kind of get left out, the Museum of Computing. Um, get, I don't know what to do about it. Um, if it was up to me, <laughs> hey, sorry. Next book, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Maybe me and Dermot will have a chat afterwards <laughs> and see if we can come up with a plan. But yeah, I mean, it pains me that they that they're not working together. And especially now that there's like a fence up between the two. That's the first time I saw that, I honestly did cry because I just thought that's terrible. Um, but yeah, no, so, I mean, I don't know how it all started really. I think it's just personalities. I just don't know the story. And I think like most things, it's probably a long and complicated story over many years. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. In terms of crowd fundraising, 2018 is quite a long time ago, and it's been intimated in 2015 for quite a few years. How do you think you might have approached it differently if you were starting from scratch now? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it is quite different now. One thing that I've really noticed is that when people want to start campaigns now, they just start them and they work straight away, you know, which didn't really happen mm. then. So I think social media and the amount of people using social media and people's knowledge of how to use social media has really, really massively moved on from 2007, 2008. So I think, I think um, it would have been a lot faster. If I was doing it now, of course, Bletchley Park probably would have shut by now, but you know, if, if I was trying to do the same sort of thing now, um, I think it would have been a lot easier, probably. Because kickstarting is recognised. Yeah, yeah, so everyone understands crowdfunding, so many more people on Twitter. You know, I mean, it's just a, kind of a, a different landscape, really, completely now. And I see, you know, I see like um, the recent um, campaign to uh, against the um, taking the suffragettes out of A-level politics. So it was, you know, it was my friend uh, who noticed that, who tweeted me. I said, you should write a blog post about it. She wrote a blog post. She pinged it out, sent it to all her friends. I pinged it out to everybody. Lots of other ping people pinged it out to loads of people. And then, you know, she's like on the news and within days and stuff happening and people listening and like politicians are on Twitter now they weren't really then and so you can have an impact much much more quickly now than you could then. Fabulous, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.